So my interest in this topic was actually uh, initiated by some student projects and I'm really going to highlight them here because I'm very proud of our students and what they can accomplish. But something that really made me certain after the 2013 flood that this was uh, something that I wanted to work on was newspaper coverage uh, related to the cost of insurance for this flood. And it was this one line that struck me. The big cost now is flooding basements by a country mile. So it's really high on the insurance industry's radar screen. And basements get flooded sometimes by overland flow, but most often by groundwater and the water table rising above the bottom of the elevation of the basement floor. And there is abundant evidence for me uh, as a subject area specialist to say that this is totally under-recognized and the way that it happens, the route of the water into the basements is totally not completely understood, but it's really important. It's probably most important to the insurance industry and it's also important to municipalities because their infrastructure, I think, provides the easiest route of water to go into the house if a basement's not completely waterproof. So it's also related to my <laughs> long-standing interest in the river-connected alluvial aquifers in Calgary, which I have been spending, I spent quite a bit of time up on my soapbox, which I try not to get onto, trying to convince people that it was a wrong place, a bad place to develop because uh, the groundwater under the river-connected alluvial aquifers is connected to the rivers and development typically equals water quality degradation. Now here's another reason not to develop river-connected alluvial aquifers because they're also really prone to flooding, not just overland flooding in the floodway and the flood fringe, but also flooding by basement. So this is uh, taken from a report of a famous early hydrogeologist whose name was Peter Maiboom or Mayboom, I've never actually heard how to pronounce his name, published in 1961. It's called Groundwater Map of, Map of the Calgary District. And what he mapped are areas of high probability of finding groundwater and it's almost exclusively the Bow River, the uh, Elbow River, the Fish Creek and the Nose Creek channels. That's the only place that you can really get a good groundwater supply in Calgary because they're permeable sand and gravel aquifers laid down by the rivers. And they're really easy to map and see today uh, just by using a digital elevation model. This is a sustainable Calgary map and you can see these same river channels really clearly. So it's very easy to know where they are without even going out into the field. And this is a cross section by Leanne Cantafio who just uh, defended her thesis in the last couple of years. And so we have, typically we have Pascapoo bedrock at depth below Calgary. And then we have a river valley here, and the river is carved down uh, 30, 40 meters in some places into the bedrock. There's some early gravels and there's some glacial deposits. And we all know where this river, river valley is because you have to go down a hill to get to downtown if you live outside the downtown core. And you have to go back up that same hill to get back home. And so it's this river-connected alluvial aquifer here. So this is a stylized water table which, uh, in which there's a possibility, not a possibility, a likelihood of, of groundwater flooding, uh, not, not only based on how far away you are from the river, but also based on how deep your basement is. Okay, so we've seen this quite a few times now. I won't go into details. I just want to expand on this part here and this flood-proof building here. So I'll just bring it up here. So here's the normal river level, here's the t uh, high stage of the river, that could be several meters different in a flood year. And so here we have flood proof building which is sitting on top of some uh, riprap which b has been brought in. Not sure if this is vegetation on this side, but here's the water table here below the ground surface, the normal ground surface. And what this building fails to show here is that our buildings have basements. So this basement here is flooded. Uh, even though it's got a higher elevation, this basement here is flooded as well. And that's not recognized in any of the flood mapping. And it would be pretty easy to, I mean, flood mapping, the, the problem, problems of flood mapping aside, it would be pretty easy to put basements into, into the picture. So these alluvial aquifers then, they're not limited too close to the river. I just want to give you my little primer on alluvial aquifers. So they're deposited by the river, could have been uh, rivers a thousand years ago, could have been rivers last year. They're usually under and on at least one side of the river. So this is a tiny little Bow River here, and this would be hillside, Sunnyside, West, West Hills, Hillhurst, 
etc. up until you go up here to Crescent Heights and all the other neighborhoods up there on the north side of the river. Uh, and the river can meander, the river meanders back and forth quite a lot with time and so sometimes it's right up against the edge and sometimes it's in the middle and sometimes it's on the other edge. At any rate, uh, there's groundwater underneath the whole river connected alluvial aquifer. Uh, and there's lots of exchange between the river and the alluvial aquifer, and I used to argue that was an issue in terms of water quality. Now I'm argue it's an, arguing it's an issue in terms of the river stage goes up and river water goes fairly quickly into the alluvial aquifer. Uh, and it's really easy to map this, this river-connected alluvial aquifer. <coughs> so here's uh, Leanne Cantafia's work. This is a river traveling through Calgary. This is downtown. This is Bow River, of course. Here's Nose Creek. Here's Boness up here. And so this is several, meter, several kilometers across in the downtown area. All river connected and all with a really high permeability. Okay, so I just want to show you some of the work. I haven't collected very much data on this yet. I'm just about to start working with students in earnest uh, this year. But I want to show you two undergraduate projects. And one was after the 2005 flood. 40 students do a capstone course in environmental science. We presented this publicly. I couldn't find this after flood 2013. I thought, man, I should be looking at that data. I couldn't find it on my computer. Contacted these four students that worked on this particular aspect of it. They couldn't find it either. And I'm at a meeting with Frank Frigo, who's a personal hero of mine. And he said, oh yeah, that was really good. I still have it on my computer. So compliments of Frank, I can show, I can show you the details today. So this, these are the, the conclusions of these four students who said to me, we want to do a door-to-door -door so social science survey and ask people about their flooding. And I said, you don't want to do that. That's way too much work. And when I, when I have that back and forth three times with a group and they say, we really want to do it, I say, okay, and I know they're going to do a good job. And these four students did a great job. This is what they found in Rideau Roxborough, two neighborhoods that were flooded in 2005 and not surprisingly again in, in 2013 that overland flow damage only accounted for 17% of the reported economic losses to those people. That means that 80, 100 minus 17, 83% is from groundwater flooding. Uh, that underground seepage, and these are the students' words, not overland flow, was responsible for most of the damage. And that setback from the river, which is uh, one way that, a simple way to regulate development, is only, is uh, only moderately appropriate for minimizing damage, and that the ground elevation at the houses was as predictive of damage as the distance from the river. So they found that uh, they could easily predict the amount of damage by the elevation of the ground with a combination of the depth of the basement below ground. And their conclusions here were to use basement depths to regulate development in the floodplain, not distance from the river, and consider zoning areas based on basement elevation above the 1 in 100 or maybe 1 in 200 if you want to be uh, more careful and the river stage level. And this is a diagram. You know, these projects, it all comes down the night, it all comes together the night before. And this is the night before when I'm working with the students. We came up with these conclusions and they drew this diagram. And so here's the Bow River. This is maybe not the best drawn alluvial aquifer, but they were under a time crunch. Here's low flow here and here's high flow up here. And so what they show is that if you have lower elevation ground, you're more likely to be flooded. And similarly, if you have a deeper basement, you're more likely to be flooded. They didn't design their study to do this, but anecdotally, when they were going to door to door, they noticed that the older houses in Rideau Roxborough, which had uh, only eight foot ceilings, tended to be flooded less than the newer houses, which had deeper basements because they had higher ceilings. So this is 2006 group of four undergraduate students that tweaked me onto this, eye, this idea. And then flood 2013 happened and I was teaching field school that fall. We couldn't go to our usual places on the river because they were flood affected. And so I thought, well, maybe we should try another quick survey of Redwood Meadows. I chose Redwood Meadows because I had a casual conversation with a colleague who lived there. And uh, he said there were some interesting patterns in the, house, in the houses that were flooded that weren't related to distance from the river. So I think most people know here that Redwood Meadows is located on high tw Highway 22 on the way to Bragg Creek, and it's uh, wholly contained within the Sutuna First Nation here. And it's right, it's a beautiful, lovely location right off against the Elbow River. Normally in low flow, you can almost walk across the river, and this is what it looked like in flood, and uh, the Sutuna First Nation uh, did a great job, according to all of the residents, of getting the 
the river armored so that there wasn't actually overland flow into the community, community down the streets of the community. But there was lots of flooding. So these are the students that did this work last September. They went door to door to more than 100, uh, 100 homes. And this is the typical flood mapping that we have. It's not mapped through the First Nation because that's not provincial jurisdiction. But here's Redwood Meadows, and you can't see it very well, but this is the uh, river-connected alluvial aquifer, this, this flat area here. And the community is built entirely on the river-connected alluvial aquifer. So here's some of the questions they asked that showed that uh, almost all of the flooding, again, can't say if it's 83%, but some significant fraction was from groundwater flooding. What did the water look like in your basement? And so groundwater would tend to be clear and non-odorous as opposed to sewage water, which would be dark and odorous. And so it, the, the number of responses is here, and most of the water that entered into the house was clear and non-odorous. You probably could have drank it with minimal treatment. Where did water come into your house? So it most often came, number of responses again here, most often came through the sump pump pool. They have sump pumps, which suggests that groundwater flooding is common. Uh, through the floor drain, through foundation cracks, and others. And very, I didn't actually go through the responses, but I don't think any houses were overland flooded here. So this is what we think, that the distance from the river in meters on the x-axis here would be related to the, to the damage due to flooding here. And there is a bit of a relationship, but it's, it's just about as good as the relationship between the depth of the, between the estimated damage and the depth of the basement below ground. So the deeper the basement, the more likely you are to have flooding, and that's because this flooding is all from water, groundwater tables rising up above the bottom of the basement floor. Then another student who's, uh, who you, you saw a little bit of her work already, Leanne Cantafio, she was looking at groundwater surface water interaction between the Bow River and using road salt as a tracer to identify how much interaction there was because it's the net interaction is so small you can't measure it by doing uh, discharge gauging off of bridges although she tried hard and she did a lot of gauging off of bridges and she included one graph which is really relevant here and this is the kind of work that we want to follow up so this is time through 2010 when she did her field work and this is water level change and this gray line here for 2010 is the river stage, the Bow River stage. And so it goes up about 70 centimeters, as opposed to the flood when it went up about 3 meters, I think. And she assumed some characteristics of the river-connected alluvial aquifer. And then she looked at what the water table would do just using a simple mathematical analytical model. Uh, 50 meters from the river, 100 meters from the river, 150 from the meters from the river, etc. So you see that the water table parallels the river quite nicely. And the farther away you are from the river, this is uh, the, the uh, more damped it is. But still, 200 meters away from the river, it's responding to the, to the river stage elevation. And then for one day here, for June the 25th, she, so, she shows a, a curve with distance away from the river. So I want you to imagine if this is actually 3 meters high, how high would the, would the river be 150 meters so away? away, how high would the water table be, 150 meters away from the river. So that's a really responsive system. And then what we haven't talked about here is the role of paleo channels in the river. So this is a schematic that shows the river going, uh, going along its merry way. And here's a paleo channel. So the river used to run here. It got filled up with gravel and it uh, chose another pathway. And this paleo channel then has gravels that are the size of the modern day uh, or the, the same river that, it, that evolved from it. So that's the most permeable material that you find. So if your home happens to be located in this paleo channel, the rate at which uh, an increased or a higher water level in the river will be propagated into the groundwater there is much, much, maybe orders of magnitude faster than in the other sediments. So there's another variation to which homes will be flooded. And in Redwood Meadows, we may have seen this variation. We didn't have quite enough data to, to get to it, but it's a really reasonable possibility. And so this is a slide from the Institute of Catastrophic Loss Reduction, who has recognized that groundwater flooding is an issue. The EU has recognized it. They've now put it into their water framework directive. If you look in the literature, there's only a handful of papers that have looked at it. So Calgary's not alone in not recognizing this. So here's uh, the water table 
here, it's, and here's the ground surface. Water table's normally below all of the infrastructure. This is a sanitary sewer. Water table rises, it surrounds the basement. If you have a waterproof basement, then you won't get flooded. But we talked, we have anecdotal reports of people whose walls started caving in, whose ceilings of their basement started uh, failing because of the pressure, the hydraulic pressure on the outside of the walls, to people who thought that they would relieve themselves of the water coming in if they drilled a hole through the cement basement floor and ended up, uh, ended up having a geyser uh, upward into the basement. And so you have to have a pretty strong house and you have to have a really waterproof house to prevent groundwater flooding. And so here's the sanitary sewer and if the easiest way into your house is through the sewer drain, then the groundwater will go into the sewer drain and go up to the height of the water table. So that means that it will be groundwater coming into your house via the sewer. That's not the same as sewer backup, which means that this, the sewage water can't drain with gravity. I have an unofficial report that it's really unlikely that there was sewage backup in much of Calgary in 2013, but lots of it was interpreted as that and, and paid for by insurance companies. And so here's a, another picture here which shows uh, that makes the point that much of this infrastructure in older areas of Calgary, which tend to be the ones that were developed first close to the river, is more than a century old and quite cracked and, and in probably considerable need of replacement and provides a nice uh, pathway for water to get into basements, which gets there because of elevated water tables, groundwater tables. And so, I, as I mentioned, we're not alone in this. Uh, hardly anybody has looked at this, and so we don't really have a good way of knowing which houses will be flooded by groundwater at this point, where the paleo channels are, that it will be flooded the fastest and, and the hardest, etc. cetera. Uh, but this is really easy to figure out. So this is, this is just schematics of the tool, the main tool of the trade in groundwater science, and that is uh, getting a drill rig on site and putting a tube in the ground and the tube's got uh, uh, holes in it or slots. It's got a screen and it tells you what the water level is. And so we need to have some of these. There are some in existence. We need to start measuring water levels in the alluvial aquifer and try to understand that relationship that I showed you with real data and match it with modeling data to look for areas that are prone to groundwater flooding and confirm uh, how we should, what we know about it so that we can deal with it more effectively. And uh, man, when I was looking at those Institute of Catastrophic Loss Reduction photos, it made me remember Richard Scarry's books, which I used to love reading to my kids. And I would love to see one uh, drawn to illustrate this. So here are my conclusions. Groundwater inundation, I think, is really significant and important in terms of flooding, uh, economic losses due to flooding. The relevant thing for planning is the elevation of the basement floor relative to the river stage elevation. You can pick off one in 100, one in 200, whatever you think. And I think that it can, it can look very much like sewer backup when it's actually groundwater inundation, that locating paleo channels and understanding how much faster high water tables propagate into those paleo channels could be really important. And that field investigation and groundwater monitoring models could go a long way to understanding the problem. <laughs>